just wanted to say that today is Friday the 13th, yeah. and my actual name is Jason Voorhees. <laughs> and this is how I look without the mask, so be careful. Um, listen guys, so I would like to invite uh, all of you, all of my guests, which are a wonderful brigade, because we're going to talk about um, innovation in education. Um, it's, it sounds a bit generic, right? I mean, everybody talks about innovation in something, innovation in taxation, innovation in equality, innovation in, uh, how do you call that? How do you call that? Sustainable growth, right? Sounds like, like one of those European hashtags. Um, you know, innovation is, a, is, a, is an easy thing. That's, a, that's an easy thing, right? It's a, like a practical implementation of an idea. That's it, that's innovation. But then education, and sometimes people, I don't know, um, mistake education with schooling, for example. And sometimes in our libertarian bubble, we, we um, mistake teaching with preaching, actually. And this is something that I wanted to talk about here with my guests. So let me start with uh, the oldest of my uh, contestants in today's uh, Blind Date edition, uh, which obviously is Jacek uh, Spendel. You're <laughs> welcome. Thank you. As you can see, he's the, the boldest defender of freedom. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, now um, number two is Glenn Kripe from uh, Britain's Northern Colonies of America. <laughs> Please welcome Glenn Kripe. Right? And um, Chris Moran, who is a co founder of Acton Institute. And you know, guys, I, I'm not going to speak about Acton Institute. If you don't know what Acton Institute is, I envy you. You must be very young, actually. <laughs> <laughs> My next class, um, and let me just start with asking each one of those um, contestants uh, one quick, tricky question. Um, yes, Expander is, is actually the guy behind Project Arizona, and it's been like, what, six, five years? It since is you uh, nearly five years. It will be five years in the winter. Okay, so uh, the first generic question about innovation to Yatek. Um, let me say that. Uh, okay, the last four years, four or five years you said that. Huh? Yeah. Um, did you experience any innovation? You know, what was the difference between 2017, 2016, and 2021? Is, is, because times are moving fast, so probably five years is, is already something, right? Yes, definitely. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning to everyone. I hope uh, you're, feel, you're, you're, you're full of energy for the uh, second day of uh, our Liberty National World Conference. Yes. Thank you for inviting us to the panel, Tomasz. Great to have you. And your question is tough. <laughs> no, uh, obviously Project Arizona is about educating young leaders for ideas of liberty and to make them stronger advocates for those, these ideas. And uh, do we uh, experience changes? Do we implement innovations in, within Project Arizona? We do, actually. We do some changes. Um, for example, the uh, first time I organized it, I did not plan any volunteering activities. In Poland, where you also come from, uh, volunteering by going uh, door to door doesn't have best reputation, right? No, of course. It's a Jehovah Witness who do this, and it's uh, not something that people react very, uh, very nicely about. But being in America and learning how U.S. democracy works, very much grassroots level, working with Americans for Prosperity, which is an awesome organization, by the way. We should have them maybe next year at our event. Uh, I learned that. Volunteering, even going door to door, talking to, to average people about average things that, that are connected to their citizenship, their relation with the, uh, the, the lawmaker that they elected, who promised something, for example, lower taxes, and didn't deliver, or, or did deliver, uh, or just talking how their community is being uh, maintained, how do they co cooperate as a community. It's really great, and my students loved it. So the uh, first time we tried it, I was skeptical. And then I was like, okay, let's do more of this. Let's do more volunteering, grassroots activism. Uh, we even did uh, programs for Telemundo in Arizona, uh, talking to, um, to Spanish-speaking um, uh, inhabitants, 
some of our students speak Spanish every year, about things that concern them but are connected to freedom. Uh, so volunteering would be one of these things we do definitely more. Um, How can you innovate in, 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 in volunteering? How you can innovate? For example, now we go with this uh, very advanced iPad, you know, and uh, making service. <laughs> No, uh, it's an implementation. This is the, the te technical aspect can change over of years, uh, but uh, also more networking meetings. This is something I learned that is extremely, extremely important to uh, make my students meet actual change makers, successful businessmen. They love it, uh, and the group is small, so everybody can ask questions, exchange business cards. Oh, another thing, I always listen to people. Uh, during project reason about things we can change. And there's this great guy, Alan Corwin, who is advocate for gun rights. He always tells me something. For example, he says, Jacek, your students should have business cards. Because they don't have business cards. How we can uh, learn uh, what's their phone number uh, or what's their email? Uh, make business cards for them. So this was two years ago. Now, every start of project reason, they get business cards. Um, small things sometimes, like we have this fundraiser for people and I tell my students speak loud because they need to hear you on the other side of the room uh, you know people very often chat and it makes noise but Alan told me Jacek next year microphones and I delivered next year <laughs> so small things they, 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 they make the experience pages. better oh, yes. Yes. that's the first thing that's missing on every event Expansion yeah. tables. You know that this, there's no liberty. It's not sexy, maybe, table. but this is so important to have extension cords, microphones, business cards. It's boring, but it's, it's a necessity. It's bread and what, butter <laughs> of, of our activism. And toast. Um, so this is the last five years. Now we're gonna, uh, you know, skip to Glenn because this is the last. How, do you, how much was it? Sixteen years or something like that with with liberty camps. So, um, Glenn is the person behind 75 editions, more than 75 editions of Liberty Camp in like 30 countries. So it's like, what countries were those? Do you remember like half of it? Let's have a memory of that. 3,000 students. So you can say something about um, um, education and, and innovation. Sure. Because, because uh, what I wanted to say, maybe sometimes we don't need you know, the new iPads. Maybe it's, you know, the technological part is not the only way we can innovate. Innovate, the word itself actually means, you know, um, I don't want to sound like uh, Steve Bannon right now, but this is like, make things new again. The job is Bannon. from the, you know, MAGA team. Oh, really? Because it's in Nova 8, you know, so it's like, make things new again, reuse them, so we can innovate by uh, going back actually to, to, to Stone Age and do something innovative with stones. I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense. But, but, but what's the idea of this Liberty Camp? So we are meeting and having a, having a camp, a conversation. Um, could you tell us something about it? Sure. And how did that change during those 16 years? Because that's my point. That's the goal. Actually. Yes, okay. Well, the, the program from the beginning was innovative. And as far as I know, it's still the only program of its kind in the world. However, I didn't invent the concept. The concept was invented by some of our brothers and sisters here, like Ken Schoolman, in uh, 20 years ago. They went to Lithuania and they, start, they organized groups of students, which often were 20 Lithuanians and 20 Belarusians. And our other dear friend, Yaroslav Romanchuk, brought 20 uh, Belarusians across the border into a free country, into a Western country for the first time. And they would meet on the shores of, of uh, Lake Trakai, by Trakai Castle, or sometimes by the, the sea at, what's the name of the town? It's a beach town in Lithuania. Yeah, beach town in Lithuania. Okay. Yeah, I think that's it. So, <laughs> <laughs> is there a Lithuanian doctor? Yeah, where did you go? Okay. So they had informal discussion groups for three or four or five days, uh, out in the woods or on the beach, uh, I went to one of these camps, uh, and they called it English Camp. And I went there and I said, this is the greatest week I've ever had. I want to do these things in other countries. So my, in, I didn't invent the concept, but my innovation was to figure out how to bring these camps to other countries. In other words, what made it so special? What kind of people do we want? How do we find students? I quickly realized that uh, it depended 
this is, the key was to find good local partners. So we started in Slovakia in 2007. I, it will take a while for me to remember all 34 countries, but I can tell you that we spread to eight countries in Africa, mostly sub-Saharan Africa. We went to 14 former Soviet countries, and we've had just amazing experiences bringing freedom to young people in these countries. Uh, at the, our first camp in Slovakia, one of the students, there were 10 Polish students, and guess who was the leader? Yes! <laughs> that's, how I met, that's how I met this guy. And at the end of the week, he said, Brian, we've got to talk to you. <laughs> this has been the greatest week of my life. Next year, we have to do this in Poland. So I said, oh, oh well, yes. I mean, I always say yes. And then <laughs> later, later figure out how to pay for it. Uh, and, yeah. Well, then I sort of forgot that he kept going. He wrote to me and called me, and yeah, I'm serious, I'm serious, we're going to do this. So the next year, 2008, we had not only a camp in Slovakia, but then in Poland. And we both loved it so much, we continued doing that for 10 years, I think, didn't we? 10 years. And now we're having trouble finding students in Poland and Slovakia. But you know why? Because there's so much liberty material, there are so many liberty programs, there, there are students for liberty now that didn't really exist in 2008. So our difficulty is a measure of the success of the liberty movement in Central Europe, certainly. So now we've shifted our activities more to, uh, to India, to Southern Asia, more in Africa, and now uh, Colombia. We just finished this past week a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful five days near here at the lake at Guadalupe. And several people in the audience were there, campers, the many campers, current, past ones. We have good supporters for many years. David is <laughs> one of my best supporters. So what's the, what is the Liberty Camp? Uh, it's a, a combination of three things. It's the exploration of classical liberal ideas, the economics, the philosophy, the history, entrepreneurship. It's English conversation practice. Our students are typically not native English speakers. They are not beginners with English, but they are usually not fluent. So they're looking for conversation practice but talking about serious things. And third, we have workshops about how to use the ideas in real life, like starting a business or political activism. We had 24 students this past week, very high level, uh, good English and good interest in the really ideas. Now, uh, I'll mention how maybe how we measure success or outcome. <clears throat> Usually, a camp produces one or more new activists, people like Jacek. This is sort of my model, is how can we find more Jaceks? <laughs> and, it, and it works. And we can't always predict in advance, but our expansion over the years has come mostly from uh, uh, students from former camps. They come from their countries and they say, next year we do this in, in our country, my country, and you know, I say yes, and uh, then we go to a new country. So uh, we're looking forward to a lot of expansion here in Latin America, more events in Colombia. Uh, possibly next year, we're looking at Ecuador, Panama, and maybe Bolivia. So uh, we will continue to innovate. Okay, so let me uh, switch to Chris, because Chris, um, <laughs> Executive director of Acton Institute is a person that I could describe as a like a gateway keeper. Like you read the screenplays and, and, and ideas and, and treatments and, and synopses of, of, of projects before they are developed by Acton Institute, right? So they have to go through you. So could you tell me, is innovation a thing, like an element, something that you can spot and you can find and say, yes, this is fresh, this is something new? Is, is there a way of like, measuring the potential of something that might be innovative? Well, um, I think of innovation as where there's energy somehow, um, and it's hard to 
to describe how I perceive that when I'm reading a script or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but I often go to a number of movement events uh, with an eye toward seeing who's doing things really, really well. Um, and I want to emulate them <laughs> um, because we're all trying to change the world in favor of, of liberty and we all need to kind of understand best practices. So uh, I've seen a number of organizations over the years kind of pick up the mantle of, of energy uh, and, and it's innovative because they are where the new people are being drawn and, and uh, where there's a lot of excitement. Uh, in terms of scripts, you know, we do act and produces a lot of film. We're usually working on one major documentary at any given time. We're working on two at the moment. One on the Hong Kong story um, and one on poverty. Um, but we also receive lots of scripts unsolicited from outside organizations that want to partner with us uh, or would like uh, help funding or see it come to fruition. So I do read a lot of scripts, um, but I guess it's a sixth sense. It's kind of, you know it when you see it, uh, in particular on scripts. So you see that, that kind of sparkle that is there, and you think that you know, this, this is something that's going to work? I think in filmmaking especially, uh, you have to tell good narratives, good stories. It has to, uh, people watching it has to see themselves in the story. It has to feel like they're part of the story. Uh, so um, if people write a script that's way too theoretical, I know it will be a bust, it won't work. Uh, they have to go out and find very engaging, real-life stories with very real, colorful people um, telling the hard stuff in their own words. So we, we do a lot of very ideological arguments, but we never say them. <laughs> They're always, uh, you know, some subsistence farmer somewhere in Africa uh, or, you know, some wonderful woman in the inner city doing corn grading or something. Uh, you know, we use other people to talk about the truth of impediments to their own flourishing. Uh, and it's a common reality for all of us. We confront uh, government and, uh, unfreedom in lots of ways. That is our common uh, reality. So we need to find people who are, are uh, very likable uh, and not perceived as ideological to tell stories. So when I read scripts, I'm looking for that. I'm looking, can I see myself in here? Um, and is it speaking to, to sort of the common heart of everyone. Okay, speaking about you know our common situation is is, is 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 the elephant in the room is that the biggest educator in the world right now is the state because it's compulsory. You have to send your kids to school. You have to go there, right? So yeah. and this is a funny thing because it's a, they say that it's a human right education, right? Like like healthcare or something like that. But it's the only right. It's obligatory. You don't have to go to a doctor, right? You don't have to call a firefighter when your house is on fire, right? You just can, like, it's fine with me, right? It's, but we're living in an amazing time because uh, I think we will all witness, and uh, certainly in the United States, I can't speak to uh, outside the United States, but uh, our monopoly education, formal monopoly education system is failing. And it's obvious, and we, we know it's been failing, uh, but finally, it's obvious to all. And COVID has kind of been the final push. Um, you disagree? Well, this is the moment. Uh, it, works it, works it works that the educational system, the state-run education, oh, state, yeah, the Russian 1970s yeah, yeah, yeah. military-style training, yeah, works no, no, it produces the corporal people as it was right. supposed to. But the problem, system. the little wrinkle in that problem is that uh, human beings by our nature yearn for freedom. So the, we, we realize there's something unsettling uh, about being forced through this monopoly system. So it's up to us to help speak to those people in different ways to call them out from that situation that they're being enculturated into uh, and to you know create enough competitive, innovative, disruptive alternatives that finally people will simply 
leave the system and it will collapse. That's the hope, but I, I don't see a better moment than right now, but it won't happen if we don't seize the opportunity. Okay, this is, this is actually the answer for my next question, so I can take that out. Um, but we, we actually have reached a situation where two bad news actually combine into one good news. I don't know if, if that, I, I never knew it was possible, right? So the bad news is that government tell, uh, uh, mandates school the, the reading list, for example, right? And you say, oh, that's, that's horrible, right? And on the other hand, you have an, a, a different story that like, kids don't read. It's also very bad news that kids are not reading, but if you combine you know, the, this forced reading list with kids not reading it, it actually makes a little bit of libertarian taste, you know. Um, actually, I would like to introduce a different word than innovation right now. It's exnovation. I made a typo yesterday. <laughs> exnovation was brought up by Uncle Google. And you know what exnovation is? Exnovation is when you think that your product or idea is at its, like, state, you know, uh, state-of-the-art level and you do not invest any more thought into it, you think it's great, you think it's beautiful. And I think this is something that you know state education is doing right now. They, they are sure that it's perfect, they don't have to innovate. I mean, they can use Zoom for, for a COVID era and this is the only thing that they can kind of come up with, which is tragedy actually, schooling by Zoom, it's, it's horrible. Um, so they exnovate and my next question is actually, are we still fighting with, with you know, Captain Government, Captain State? Or maybe it's just like they are somewhere in the 19th century and the only problem is that it's obligatory, but, but we do not have to fight, fight them um, because then we are always behind them. We can innovate by doing a different story, by, by, by telling a different story actually, and opening like totally new subject. I just don't care about this Ministry of Education. Kids are not reading those books. It's fine. I mean, like, whatever, right? Yeah. Too many years of, of, of. I think we need to just circumnavigate that. Just go around, pretend state doesn't exist, uh, where we can do so, and uh, just provide education for our kids. You know, people need to be educated, <laughs> uh, and they need to be educated in a million different ways for, for maximal benefit for them, right? People learn in different ways. If you have kids, you know kids are very different. Uh, and uh, so we can only have that proliferation of creativity and different ways to educate uh, if we have real competition. I mean, we take as a maxim as libertarians that um, competition inexorably leads to more options, higher quality goods, at lower costs. And this is, this is true if, if we, we have exactly the opposite in the formal education system. We have poor quality goods and getting worse at higher and higher costs. What's your take on that, Jacek? Yeah, I, I totally agree that um, we should uh, continue, or perhaps do it better, to uh, present educational opportunities for people without looking at what state is doing. They, I cannot say anything more than Chris. They do it worse and worse for higher and higher price. There is this um, famous uh, graph showing which goods, um, it, that, that's a graph for the United States, but I think it can relate to other countries, mm -hmm. which goods um, relatively become more expensive over the years and which goods uh, becoming uh, cheaper over the years. And, and you can see clearly the goods that are heavily regulated or just uh, uh, provided as a monopoly by the states always get more expensive and those goods that are on competitive free markets, they are cheaper and more affordable. So this should be an argument for that it, you don't need to be a libertarian. You actually could be a bleeding heart person from the left. If you see that certain goods that everybody agree they are important, like technology and so on, become cheaper when the markets are open, so advocate for it. They don't. We should speak louder about these things. And um, uh, operating with stories that Chris already mentioned is super important because it relates to the common man, to the average man. If he or she see themselves in this story, uh, nothing can be done better. Obviously, we need some theory. But um, look at what, for example, uh, Institute of Justice is doing in the United States, or, or the Goldwater Institute from Great State of Arizona is doing. They are held as a, as a public interest law firm. They help the common man. They are pro bono companies. They don't take every, uh, every law case because they would need to employ thousands of lawyers, I think. 
but they take cases where the common man with, uh, for example, uh, Pops and Mam, how do you say Pops? Mam and Pops company is being um, threatened either by local government or by um, even a huge corporation trying to take over them using force without them, without the agreement on the markets and they don't know what to do. They are facing the wall. They don't have money for lawyers. They don't have money for lobbying. All, all the things that Microsoft, sorry, big companies are able to, to provide, they don't have this. But they find support in these legal interest firms and they often win because uh, the legal system, the justice system, still works pretty fine in, the, in America. Um, so these are ex amazing stories showing that economic freedom it's not about money. Money is important, but it's just a byproduct. It's about human dignity. It's about life chances, it's about your family being able to pursue their dreams. Uh, and this actually fits libertarian message very well. Um, we should do more of this. And uh, I am very angry when I see states, the government, uh, um, uh, uh, providing a compulsory compulsory um, services, healthcare, education, and so on, uh, with lower and lower quality for higher higher price. Obviously, I'm angry, and I wish public interest, sorry, uh, public policy think tanks do something about it. But um, we, the people who educate for freedom, we should not just wait with uh, our hands uh, and uh, finger point, I told you, that's not enough. We should provide something uh, that is competitive, that is maybe alternative. Maybe they think that, you know, um, understood as a simplification, but it looks like you know the, market, the, the government has uh, inflationary markets. Everything is, is, is more and more expensive. And in non-governmental or at least semi-non-governmental markets are deflationary because each year you can buy a better cell phone for the same amount of money, for $1,000. You know, each year, even with the inflation we have, you, you can buy like a, a cell phone that is like twice as fast and, and, and uh, capable of doing things, like connecting to Mars and things like that. So, I mean, let, let, let's stay in the government area for a moment. Do you think that it is even... Can you consider yourself a libertarian if you try to, I don't know, um, provide like Austrian economics or whatever classes inside of a public school? Because I know I've heard of projects like that. Can you go there? Is it still kosher or libertarian to go there and, and say that, you know, we can provide like a basic curse, uh, crash curse in, in economics, things like that? Because teachers, in public school teachers, they love it. They still are getting paid, they don't have to work, and they give you two hours to talk about Karl <laughs> Yes, we have a project like that in Poland, yeah, right? I know. It's it's good. And uh, I, will, I will talk very briefly and then I give my microphone. I think as long as your activity is pro uh, supported with uh, voluntary uh, funds, uh, money that is mm -hmm. uh, taken from people without... But the building was, you know, okay, by the state. Okay, but uh, the roads... <laughs> <go to the, laughs> of course, <laughs> but government we cannot be... Too, drink. I don't think we should be too cautious. If we are too cautious, it means what? We cannot drive our cars on the public roads. Uh, we cannot walk along on the public sidewalks. We shouldn't go too far. But as long as our um, educational um, program is supported with um, with funds that are provided voluntary, uh, and we have good program, and they invite us there to the temple of government, then I think we should take this opportunity. Um, you can ask also different yes. questions. How about inside the Death Star? We just <laughs> have seen that. that. How about teaching these ideas by, by, by the state schools? That, that's another question, but I will give my microphone now to the second like, like, yes, yes. um, Okay, so my question will be about camps, actually, but maybe detoxication camps. Somebody yesterday mentioned a great idea that maybe we don't need more education, we don't need to talk about Karl Menger. We should start with like actually brainwashing those kids. I mean, like washing them out of this, this I don't know, <sighs> Um, modern monetary tyranny, however they call it, I don't remember, you know, because that's how kids operate right now. You know, fair share and, and capitalism is bad for the planet and things like that. How can you start you know, talking about, you know, um, the, the business cycle with a person like that? It's impossible. No. 
So, 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 so who are your guests? You know, the people that come to your Liberty Camp. Are they like somewhere in between? Like I don't know. Maybe deficit is good actually. Maybe you know, it's inflation is okay and money you now stays. Yeah, it's well, tiny, tiny, tiny inflation. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of cancer. Exactly. Money is a state product, so actually they can do it whatever they like. And then you come with your like you know knowledge as a Jedi warrior, and then you say no. <laughs> Mm. Uh, okay, okay. Big question. You know. <laughs> yeah. First of all, our, our students, uh, our students are, uh, they come from all different backgrounds. They have different levels of knowledge about the real ideas. Uh, it's, we assume that they have not read uh, our favorite works, Bastia, Brain, and Hayek. We assume they haven't, but usually we are pleasantly surprised that many of them have. Uh, this week. One young man came up to me and said, I just finished reading Atlas Shrugged, and I wonder what you recommend to read next. Atlas Shrugged next. Next. <laughs> After Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> What's the next? <laughs> the Judgment Day. Atlas Shrugged too. <laughs> well, um, maybe found him, maybe essays. But uh, that was a very nice surprise. And uh, another young man said, uh, I had just finished reading Human Action uh, in English, so in his third language. So, uh, you know, we have amazing things. We, we look for people who are uh, opinion leaders, people who read more and think more, even at age 20, 22, and uh, probably all of you were, were like this at age 20 or 22. Uh, and then we look for ways to nurture them. Uh, we try to ask challenging questions. Part of the program is to uh, examine the things you said like the taxation or the use of government services. Uh, an important question is, is it good to make money? Is it good to make lots of money? Would you like to be rich? And in most places we go, even with liberal-minded people, they don't have good answers for these things. But we say, you know, you guys, you got to have good answers for these things. You have to have it for your personal development, and you have to have it to defend yourself in a hostile culture. Now, the results are different in different countries. Here, I don't think that's a huge problem. But in former Soviet countries, people still have ways of thinking that we need to challenge. In these countries, our students, our 20-year-old 20, 20 students, have grown up in a free country, more or less. But the parents didn't, and their teachers didn't, and their grandparents didn't, which means that the te their teachers are not teaching them these things in a free country. I think you've, you've seen that in Poland. Uh, I'll just take a second to, to second what Chris said about the current uh, education opportunity in America. And I'm not talking about other countries because I'm not smart enough or arrogant enough to do that. But what I've seen in America, you know, for 30 years, maybe 40 years, maybe more, some of us and our friends have pushed for education reform. We pushed for homeschooling or vouchers or whatever with moderate success. And suddenly, a year ago, our government said, don't go to school, stay home. You're on your own. Well, hold on, but, well, yes, <laughs> it handed us this opportunity. We've won. So what are we going to do with this? Uh, I have at least three friends who were teachers in the government schools and were told to stay home <coughs> by the labor unions or the governments. And after a few weeks of this, they started thinking and talking to their neighbors, uh, okay, children still need an education and most parents can't give them what they need, so what can we do? And, oh, we need to keep paying the teachers for not teaching? I don't think so. Building a new school that no one will come to? I don't think so. So a couple of my friends have told me, uh, you know, we're starting to take groups, and I've always had this dream of starting a school, starting my own school. I thought, now's the time. Take your stimulus check and start a school, and I'll help you. So I agree completely. I, I, you know, it, it's been a disastrous year. I wish it hadn't happened. But at this point, is there any sentient creature on Earth who can still argue for central planning, government planning. 
is there anybody who can defend the arrogant elite who try to tell us how to live our lives? I think they're tremendous, you know, we've got to make the most of this. Yeah, I mean, welcome to Poland. You have to visit our country. You know, Poland uh, is it, called um, a post-communist country. We often use that phrase, post-communist country. I, I think it's no longer valid. We should say it's pre-communist country, because we, we're going there again. So, um, can I respond before you ask me something else? Right, yeah. Okay, so as to your question about should we teach Austrian economics in the public schools, yeah. my, my flippant radical libertarian answer is no, that would be like teaching cannibals to eat with knives and forks. <laughs> and fine, <laughs> that's that's uh, <laughs> but I don't really mean, I'm somewhere between the two of you on that. I mean, I wouldn't expend a lot of effort uh, and finances, but our materials are free for them to use and explore, and if teachers want to use it, that's better than nothing for my job. I also support this program, the one we have in Poland, it's called LAM. Like the economy, it's like economy lessons for, for, for youngsters. Absolutely, I, I donated money to them, I helped them, you know, with media, and, and I absolutely support them, so I'm just asking questions, you know, to, yeah. to know your opinion. Now, I'm also on this uh, formal education, what, what we need to do for the final collapse of government schools is challenge the monopoly credential system, right? So right now, uh, we all believe we have to get a high school degree and then we need a bachelor's degree from college because that's the only way to get a job. That certainly was true, well, a certain kind of job. That was certainly true, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, we're at the point now where it's really not true anymore. Uh, you have places like Google, which has decided that the product from colleges is useless, so they're creating their own credentialing system. Uh, and many other companies are following suit. So a smart kid, like I, now my fourth, uh, final child is in college, and he decide, he argues with himself and me every day whether he should stay in. He should just go, you know, get one of these Google degrees and, and jump into the workforce. And I I I, I support that. <laughs> There's nothing good happening at his college campus uh, in any respect at the moment. Um, so what needs to happen is more employers saying, we don't care about your credential. We want to know that you can do the job well. And there's lots of ways to demonstrate your skill. Uh, and we need to be more innovative in designing those platforms for young people to, to prove their capabilities to be eligible for some of these jobs. But as long as uh, you know, employers still declare there's value in, in this worthless credential, it'll be hard. But we're right at the tipping point. Uh, we're, we're almost there, and it's being aided by a number of factors. COVID obviously has been huge. Also, higher education is bankrupt. Uh, it's, it's been an unworkable business model um, for many years. Uh, for example, the inflation rate Compounded inflation rate for higher education in the United States for the last 30 years is 28%. It's ridiculous. Um, no other industry uh, can gets anywhere close to that, um, and it just doesn't work. And finally, families and students aren't willing to take on the debt and the rest. So I think we're lots of things are happening just at this moment. We need employers to have the courage to say, "Forget the credential. Tell me what you can do." Is, it, is that true that you cannot be a firefighter without a college diploma in the United States? Uh, at any kind of college, any kind of diploma. So, uh, there was this period of time when everyone, you know, we assumed everyone had to have a four-year college degree. Um, and it's just not necessary. Some people aren't really suited for college. Uh, and they certainly don't need to be successful in life to have a, a flourishing life and raise a family. And we force them, it's actually cruel, we force people who aren't suited for college to collect $1,600,000 worth of college loans in the United States so they can get a $30,000 a year job uh, that they could have gotten you know, out of high school or even without high school. Um, and uh, so a lot of the professions, like the firefighters and the rest, police officers, began to move in this credentialing path where they thought, sure, why not, everyone should have a college degree. That's changing again. So 
Uh, I think there was a period of time where it was hard to get any job in the U.S. without a degree, uh, unless you're you know, waiting a table or something. Uh, but, but that is changing, too. That's part of what's happening right now in this COVID moment. Uh, okay, so I would like to skip to another part of innovation, the technical innovation, especially when it comes to social media. And I don't want to talk about you know, how social media are opening the world for us and everybody can read the same blog and things like that. Now, I know that all of you in absolutely different departments, you heavily rely on social media at your work. But how would you act if you were um, branded unfit for society, cancelled, I don't know how you say it, cancelled culture, culture, demonetized and things like that. Um, how could you innovate then? What would you do? What, how would you use your resources? Starting with Project Arizona. Uh, this, is, this, is really tough. Tough. Yeah. this is really tough. Uh, actually, social media is a very important tool for us for spread the word, what is Project Arizona, why it's worth to apply and so on and so forth. By the way, we are still recruiting for 2022, so check it out, projectarizona.us. Uh, little advertisement. No, uh, uh, what we, we, uh, we use social media, but this is not the only this is not the only technology we use to spread the word. We, for example, we always send hundreds of emails to use that technology. You ask how would we um, act if we are deplatformed on social media? Yeah, for example, for me, email is not social media. No, no, is it? I was told uh, uh, social media is right. Facebook, LinkedIn. Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 email is not social media. Email is not social media. No. Email is less control. Email will be never as much control as the If you are cancelled, that means that you know the operator can I say that you know no longer. Your order is not expired. I would need to uh, live in North Korea probably <laughs> to be cancelled to that degree that I cannot send email. This is possible. I hope we are not heading there. Um, but uh, yes, for so for example, sending traditional emails. They look boring for young people, but yeah. this is the way to. To, to communicate what we are doing, why it's important to asking people to, um, uh, to promote us through newsletters. They are also not going to be cancelled with the cancel culture. Uh, I don't think so. Um, using, what else? Uh, word of mouth. However, it's hard when you want to do something on a global scale, right? I, I don't know that many people in Rwanda, for example. But are you prepared to be like, banned on Facebook? We prepared never... to be banned on Facebook. I am not fully prepared, to be honest. I always wished there will be another platform uh, that we have a, an option to move to if, if Facebook is going too far. And I know there were tries to start something. I never actually supported any legislation against Facebook, and I still do not. Yeah, of course. I know there are some people on the, probably on the right wing that I don't like this, because I believe you don't follow something, you can switch elsewhere. But when I learned a few months ago that actually a competition cannot start uh, from the scratch because Google is controlling some servers and they are monitoring who is trying to compete and what kind of... This scared me a bit, to be honest, because I was always in favor of, and I'm still in favor of competition, but I don't know how to compete if things like that happen. Um, maybe it's still possible, maybe the servers must, must go elsewhere, maybe it will take time, maybe we need uh, servers on the international seas or, or something like that, but definitely uh, people who have different worldview than major social media platforms, they overslept this for years. They thought, they assumed, and maybe I'm one of them, <laughs> but the technology people most importantly overslept that. They thought that the, the, there will be always place for them on Facebook, or always place for them on Twitter, um, and uh, they didn't think on what to, how to create something competitive if Facebook is no more... Uh, that, that, was, that was actually the part of the Facebook and Google business plan, to let everyone in, even the wackos, you know, flat earth, whatever, deniers, and, and yeah. things like that. I mean, flat earth denier, I mean, that's a nice combination. <laughs> flat earth denier. Flat earth denier. I should have a t-shirt. <laughs> Trust me, I'm flat earth denier. <laughs> Let's go back to letters, right? Christianity was built on letters, like you know, two Corinthians. Please check this five loves. Yeah, I don't know if my latest. Oh, no. oh okay. So, Len? 
Uh, well, well, a world without email, I think, is going to be really, really tough. So, and anybody remembers the world without email? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we, we had a fax machine. We started with a fax machine. Uh, uh, social media, I, for my project, I... Uh, um, does anybody write? <laughs> but a, a key feature of my project is uh, decentralization. So part of my mission is to find and uh, support and mentor local partners. So I, if the question is narrowly, if, if, if it's a narrow question of being banned from Facebook, that won't be a problem. If it's a question of being banned for more of the internet in general, including email, that's going to be a huge problem. But still, that will probably affect me more than local partners because we have local partners who continue to have meetings even during lockdowns and quarantines. In Tanzania, they didn't do that. In Tanzania, they had group discussions. They discussed Jonathan Gullible in person. Uh, they met. We zoomed in to help them, but, and we sent them a bit of money. Uh, and they printed and translated books. So the activity didn't stop. We didn't have a liberty camp like we did last week, where we bring people from other countries. That stopped for a year. That's coming again. But local, local people, I guess I'm saying I'm, I would rely on our local partners to find local solutions. If, if I'm banned on Facebook, or they are banned on Facebook, we don't depend on that that, that much. Uh, we do a lot of work on social media, and it's mostly intentionally the big end of a funnel. Uh, we're trying to introduce ourselves to as many people in the world as possible. But our real business model is to identify leaders and to spend our time and effort forming them. So we run uh, pre-COVID 22 in-person conferences a year, and they are some of them are quite large, thousand-person conferences, all the way down to very small 20-person conferences for CEOs of uh, organizations, or poverty fighting organizations, or business CEOs of business. Uh, so our real effort. Um, and resources is trying to invest in leaders who have spheres of influence uh, that are quite substantial. Um, so if we got shut off on the big funnel, I think we would have to coast along for a while with uh, having formed thousands of leaders who are continuing to uh, both promote the idea, not so much our institution, it's not about us, we're not institution builders, we're idea builders. Uh, and uh, so if they don't talk about us, but they're still promoting liberty, that's fine. Uh, so it would be, we, we've also, to mitigate the problem, we, we have uh, gone into all of our social media platforms and we've downloaded all of our content and we do that on a regular basis now and keep it stored in a secure location because if they cancel you, they own all that data and you don't have access to it, it's just gone, poof, in an instant. So we've at least, taken that risk into account and have backed up those systems. I've asked that question because may, maybe this situation and this, uh, consciousness. this consciousness, the, the, the more people know that Facebook or other platforms can, can cancel you actually, maybe it, it sounds like a backlash in, 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 when it comes to technology, but actually this may push us to think further, to like, let's just like skip those guys, let's think further, let's leave them alone, as, a, as we talked about the state uh, before, let's just forget about them, maybe, I don't know, maybe blockchain will help us to like overcome this problem and not, not to take care about, you know, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg anymore. Um, my, my, my closing question to you, and then I would like to have some questions from, from our viewers, is do you think that technology innovation, technological innovation, mixed with ideology, of course, can make education stateless so that, so that we don't have to uh, agree on that. Like, okay, it's like 12 years of slavery, but you know, we can live with it. <laughs> it's okay, who cares, it's just 12 years. No, no, can we make education stateless somehow? Uh, I think absolutely. I mean, the content, uh, the systems for helping individuals grow at their own pace and all the rest of uh, individualized education, right, which is what we value in every uh, human action is our own choice, uh, 
and uh, that's there. I mean, that's present. Those ideas have been innovated. Uh, they need to be developed in more competition, create more ideas. So it, it isn't at all a question of whether technology is there or immediately will be there to help provide that. It's, again, the question of uh, whether we can push back the life illegally uh, and keep people out of legal jeopardy for, for pursuing um, education through technology. Uh, yes, I second all that, absolutely. Uh, we are, this is becoming a more important part of our program as well. And again, our camp that we just finished is a good example because one of our sponsors and partners is Sertel. Esteban is over here, and uh, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, I'm not sure the mission is exactly to be stateless, but that's an effect, that's a consequence. They're producing a liberal material, libertarian material in Spanish and English, and they've, they've designed a very nice platform of all kinds of media. Uh, I know Acton is doing this, Fee is doing this, many of our friends, and in our programs around the world, we are starting to incorporate, starting to show our students that this material is available, and most of it is English and it comes from outside their country. We also want to connect the, the local partners with resources, because some of them are looking to change their school system, or to introduce material, free market material, into their schools. Or if the schools don't let them, they operate outside the schools. They have weekend discussions. So uh, I think, yeah, yes, it's, yeah, it's happening. It's going to be hard to stop, and it's really good. Okay, I, I will surprise you now. Okay, okay thank you. Because uh, <laughs> we talk a lot about uh, how we can go around the state. This is super important, obviously, and I, 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 I'm, I'm uh, fully uh, advocating for this. But there are actually in very few places, Arizona is one of them, um, uh, propositions to to innovate within the state system of education in a very, very interesting way. And this uh, example in Arizona I'm talking about is called ESA, Educational Savings Account. Um, again, Americans for Prosperity is really pushing for it, a few other organizations, Ed Choice, and so on. Um, these guys um, understand that for probably next few decades, we will not get rid totally of, of state in education, but we can reduce uh, this involvement. It doesn't need to be the pressure model anymore. So what they advocate is that uh, they, they calculate how much money is spent on kids, and they have this quote per kid, how much it is, a uh, few thousand dollars. Voucher system. And it's a type of voucher system, yes. It's a type of voucher system where parents get uh, equivalent of this money uh, in their account, and but the difference between the Friedman system and this ESA is that according to ESA, they can they don't need to spend it on traditional schools. They can spend it on Ron Paul K-12 program, which is one of these programs available on the internet. Um, and there are many other interesting programs. There, there, are, there are programs connected to religion, for example, connected to objectivism, connected to few other things, and uh, if it only has anything to do with education, you can spend it. And hell, uh, internet offers so much these days, uh, either cheap or, or even free knowledge, right? So it, uh, they, they uh, understand it, and you can spend this, this voucher on multiple different things. Probably you can spend them on liberty camps, if, 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 if they get a receipt. Uh, so maybe this is a way where a state, uh, in this case we are talking about a particular state within the US, can innovate and can uh, change its approach from the heavy hand Prussian model into something much lighter. Unfortunately, this huge opposition, immense opposition, trade unions are, are, are on the forefront and this ESA model is only available for to, for tiny percentage of the kids in the state of Arizona. Not because tiny percentage wants it, because the lobby for one size fits all people is so strong that they, after these big debates in the state uh, senate and house, they agree that maybe one percent of the kids can enjoy it. And for this one percent, there's huge demand. They are they are almost fighting to to be part of ESA. Um, I wish there's more ESA. And uh, obviously, at the end of the horizon is 
uh, education without any government. But if we, if, if, the, um, if, if this law, if this word is uh, paid with ESAs, I'm okay with this road. We need to change it. Do you want to mention the uh, project that Crystal Solvinsky and others are doing with the uh, standards? Uh, you can mention. <laughs> It's an example of working within the system. So, or if you like, taking advantage of the tax dollars. Uh, and uh, I'm not well informed on this, so I just mentioned that in Arizona, a group of people who share our ideas, especially about Austrian economics and free markets, uh, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, created materials and a curriculum for teaching high schools high school students, and they uh, got the Arizona Board of Education to approve this material to be taught in high schools. They then developed training programs for economics teachers to teach the free market oriented material. So uh, I can't tell you uh, how successful this has been. I don't know how many teachers, how many students, but this curriculum is available. There are a couple of people in the audience who might be able to elaborate on that. Our time is also up, so if you're standing watching my side. No, really. Because I wanted to ask the last, very last question only to Jacek. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and, and to say, this is where you uh, will decide that I'm a libertarian heretic. But 20, 25 years ago, I was in, invited by a supporter and uh, free market friend to be on the board of this for profit charter school company. Um, and I said, Yes, but I said, on, on one condition, uh, someday I'm going to turn on you. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, we need charters to provide the competition to destabilize and ultimately destroy the government schools, of which you're a part. Uh, and uh, I can't continue to support you because you don't give justice to the taxpayer, ultimately. Uh, so, I've been working a little bit in the system, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, but about, it's about time where I tell him it's time I turn on you. Yes, the, the very last question um, is specifically and only to Jacek, because you know, we talk about kids, we talk about school, and I don't know if you know that the, Jacek has just entered the, the exclusive club of young fathers. Uh, it's his first professional Innovation is about changing perspective. Is your perspective anyhow changed? Because you know now it's personal, right? <laughs> so you're not talking about some kids in Bangladesh. You're talking about your kids. So it's a different story. Are you a little bit more afraid that you know in eight years I will have to push my little kids into that system? Well, my wonderful child is so small that I'm not yet thinking in terms of you know education and, and stuff like that. Uh, perhaps your children who are in kindergarten, right? You know, you probably think a lot about this, too. Well, uh, I'm already very much anti-state, and, uh, and uh, uh, I wish there is much less uh, government, government uh, intrusion on, on the young children. I, I believe we, we will be choosing some solutions that are uh, at least partially stateless, but I, I, I cannot give you the answer what exactly we will uh, choose for our child because it's not yet the time. However, I'm very, very skeptical to what the government offers. It's brainwashing, it's expensive, yeah. and you know what it is. Okay, so do we have any uh, flat air deniers? <laughs> okay, so um, uh, we only have time for one question. Um, I'm sorry, but, and we're gonna take a little bit of time for the coffee break after, uh, so we're gonna go with you, Steve. Hi, thank you for the panel. I'm Justyna from Poland. I'm 23 years old, so I'll ask from a very um, young perspective, very practical one. So I will start my MAs soon. And what do you guys have some practical tips to become an ally uh, for the libertarian movement for young people who are <laughs> surrounded by fake news? And they're not, believe me, they're not scrolling through books, through pages of books, but through Twitter, through Instagram, and sometimes it can be a little bit intimidating when you want to come up to them and to actually give them solutions. And I also got an, had an impression of you talking about CEOs and CEOs, leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, etc. But honestly, 
everyday life doesn't look like that. <laughs> and we all know that. So if we want to recruit more people and spread liberty around the world, I don't agree that our focus should be mainly on those people. Like that's very impressive to know three, five languages. Great. <laughs> I really enjoy that. But um, not everyone is like that. So as a young person who wants to enter the liberty world or in a non deeper level, you have some practical tips, really practical ones. I'm not going around the bush, so that's my quick question. I would really appreciate your answer. Well, the purpose of educating leaders in our case is because they have, you know, if they're president of a university, they have thousands of students that they can teach. So, I mean, our intention is to reach common people as efficiently as possible using the principle of leverage. Uh, but many of our programs are, in fact, targeted at young people who are leaders. As to your first point, um, I, I find a lot of people today um, don't know where to turn for information up, for data. Um, and not all sources are reliable. Of course, there's no objective truth that anyone's going to put out there on social media, so I just challenge you to, to find a basket of uh, feeds that, that you read on a regular basis so you don't get sort of pulled into uh, a corner. Um, that's my advice. I, well, for our program, we, um, it's, we're sort of aiming at the result that I think you want. Uh, our, my model is to uh, bring together opinion leaders or future opinion leaders in order to get the leverage and then have them try to give them tools so that they can reach all the people that you want to reach. That's not, it's not possible for me to reach millions of people. What I can do, uh, I'm sort of guided by what Hayek suggested about trying to change the intellectuals, uh, trying to change. Uh, though it's more realistic to aim at 10% of the population instead of 100%. So uh, our, our young people will have to do that. Uh, you know, we, have, we look for that leverage. That's the only way to reach large numbers, I think. Okay, I totally agree with my predecessors, and I saw Mark Victor's hand before, and I'd like to give my time to him because I'm sure he has awesome questions. Uh, but you can, that would be like the last cake. Thank you. Um, what brings us together is a belief in a principle. We share a belief in a principle that we know works that we know is just, and we know will raise standards of living. Yet 50 years later, here we are at a world conference with a small room of people. We should have a million people. If there's anything we need to innovate on, isn't it our message? Don't we need to do a better job delivering an obvious, simple message that makes sense to the common person? Why have we failed, and how can we innovate? that libertarians are failing is because they're not putting faces into the economic numbers. We are just saying, for example, the TV, uh, TV, the GP, the GDP. GDP per capita in Estonia increased 500% uh, in the last 20 years. That's awesome. But what is the face behind that? What is the story? What is the... Um, yeah, we have to, to talk about the storytelling. This is uh, what we uh, talk about. We're not talking about the storytelling. We have to put faces because we are um, we are not rational. We are more emotional. We uh, we're moved by emotions. So that's that's our biggest mistake, I think. No, I I agree. Uh, we are beings that require inspiration as, as well as data. Uh, and uh, so we have to win the hearts and the minds to, to get people behind us. I also think, well, I don't, we, I don't have full answer for this because if, if we have the full answer, we'll have this million of people here. <laughs> but perhaps the part of the answer is in your question the simple principle. Are we communicating well that this principle is simple and that 
you know, uh, when you are asked about um, the drug laws and you are asked about education, state education, and when you are asked about gun rights, you don't need to have three different uh, answers, but you, you need to come back to this core principle first and make, the, make this uh, liberty argument structured and uh, make it logical, make it simple. Very often we are uh, attacked by the mainstream. You are too simple. Actually, this is a beauty, and we should be, we should actually underline the simplicity, um, the, the simple morality, the simple rules behind the libertarian message is something we should actually talk more about, not less. And perhaps we can reach more hearts and minds this way. Thank you. Thirty seconds. Yeah, uh, Mark, that's a good question and complex question. I would just suggest that there maybe might be another way of looking at it or measuring. Uh, think of all the Students for Liberty conferences that go on all year in nearly every country, hundreds of chapters. Think of the regional uh, forums and conferences of Atlas and PE and Objective Standard Institute and many others. I think if you look at the, I don't think you'll ever see a conference of a million people together, and I'm not sure we want that, but what we do have is millions of people every year in decentralized conferences, and I think that's a tremendous success. That was the Thank you very much for attending our panel. Thank you very much.